the world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. Welcome to this very special presentation of the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name is Jenny Niven. I'm a programmer and producer, and I suspect, like you, I'm a huge fan of beautiful and arresting literary fiction, which is why we're all here this afternoon for the enormous privilege of meeting Jenny Offal. Jenny uh, Offal is an American writer. Uh, she's the author of Last, uh, Last Things of Department of Speculation and now in 2020, The Remarkable Weather. She's a hugely critically acclaimed writer. Um, De Department of Speculation was shortlisted for the Folio Prize, the Penn Faulkner Award and the LA Times Book Award. Um, in 2016, she was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. She teaches writing at Bard College. She's published extensively for children too, um, and Weather was recently shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction. There could not be a more timely moment for the publication of this book. While it deals with another seismic collective emergency, climate change, there's almost something eerie about its prescience and its relevance for this year and its extraordinary events. It's a slender novel that rattles and questions such critical ideas as our sense of safety, of community, of personal and collective responsibility, our sense of agency, how to stay afloat. It's almost the sort of literary equivalent of both an instruction manual and a life vest. I think if you look to art and specifically great writing to illuminate and make sense of and sustain us in really strange times and to help us name and identify and explain why we behave the way that we do, then you might find yourself clutching the slim but powerful novel long past the end of 2020. So if you would um, join me in welcoming, although it's harder to do that online than if we were in one of the big tents in Charlotte Square, um, but a very warm welcome to our guest this afternoon, Jenny Offal. Hi, thanks for having me. 
Hi, Jenny. So unbelievably, um, this book was written before the events of 2020 and COVID-19 with a very different sort of emergency in mind, um, climate change. But before we dive in, I think, to my questions, of which I've got a few, and then towards the end of the event, the last 15 minutes or so, we'll be able to take some questions too from the audience. Um, so if you're watching live, please do send us your thoughts and your questions. Um, but before we do all that, if you wouldn't mind just setting the scene and give us an giving us a sense of um, the tone and the st style and the, the remarkable nature of weather. Um, would you read for us? Sure. Um, I'm going to read from the very beginning. Um, and it's just taking place at a university library where the narrator, uh, Lizzie, works. In the morning, the one who is mostly enlightened comes in. There are stages, and she is in the second to last, she thinks. This stage can be described only by a Japanese word. Bucket of black paint, it means. I spend some time pulling books for the doomed adjunct. He has been working on his dissertation for 11 years. I give him reams of copy paper, binder clips, and pens. He is writing about a philosopher I have never heard of. He is minor, but instrumental, he told me. Minor, but instrumental. But last night, his wife put a piece of paper on the fridge. Is what you're doing right now making money, it said. The man in the shabby suit does not want his library fines lowered. He is pleased to contribute to our institution. The blonde girl whose nails are bitten to a quick stops by after lunch and leaves with a purse full of toilet paper. I brave a theory about vaccinations and another about late capitalism. Do you ever wish you were 30 again? Asked the lonely heart engineer. No, never, I say. I tell him that old joke about going backward. We don't serve time travelers here. A time traveler walks into the bar. On the way home, I pass the lady who sells whirling things. Sometimes when the students are really stoned, they'll buy them. No takers today, she says. I pick out one for my son, Eli. It's blue and white, but blurs to blue in the wind. Don't forget quarters, I remember. At the bodega, Mohan gives me a roll of them. I admire his new cat, but he tells me it just wandered in. He will keep it though, because his wife no longer loves him. I wish you were a real shrink, my husband says. Then we'd be rich. My brother Henry's late, and this after I took a car service so I wouldn't be. When I finally spot him, he's drenched, no coat, no umbrella. He stops at the corner, gives change to the woman in the trash bag poncho. My brother told me once that he missed drugs because they made the world stop calling to him. Fair enough, I said. We were at the supermarket. All around us, things tried to announce their true nature, but their radiance was faint and fainter still beneath the terrible music. I try to get him warmed up quickly, soup, coffee. He looks good, I think, clear-eyed. The waitress flirts with him. People used to stop my mother on the street. What a waste, they'd say, eyelashes like that on a boy. So now we have extra bread. I eat three pieces while my brother tells me a story about his Narcotics Anonymous meeting. A woman stood up and started ranting about antidepressants. What upset her most was that people were not disposing of them properly. They tested worms in the city sewers and found they contained high concentrations of Paxil and Prozac. When birds ate these worms, they stayed closer to home, made more elaborate nests, but appeared unmotivated to mate. But were they happier, I asked him? Did they get more done in a given day? The window in our bedroom is open. You can see the moon if you lean out and crane your neck. The Greeks thought it was the only heavenly object similar to Earth. Plants and animals 15 times stronger than our own inhabited it. My son comes in to show me something. It looks like a pack of gum, but it's really a trick. When you try to take a piece, a metal spring snaps down on your finger. It hurts more than you think, he tells me. Ow. I tell him to look out the window. 
That's a waxing crescent, Eli says. He knows as much now about the moon as he ever will, I suspect. At his old school, they taught him a song to remember all its phases. Sometimes he'll sing it for us at dinner, but only if we do not request it. The moon will be fine, I think. No one's worrying about the moon. Thank you for that. It's such, such a pleasure to hear, hear you read that in your own voice, Jenny. It's just wonderful. And there's so many things in that for people who know the novel. Um, it, <laughs> it's such a, there's so many tales that lead you on to different, different things that are in there, whether it's the tone and the humour or, or even the style, the precision with which you write and the kind of interiority of, of Lizzie. Um, yeah, thank you. And the, the expressions, the things in the supermarket are constantly trying to announce their true nature. <laughs> I just really love that. Can you just tell us though a little bit about how you got started with this novel? Because it ostensibly deals with climate change and a story like climate change with no real beginning and hopefully no end. Um, where, do you, where do you begin a narrative like that? Well, um, I, I was interested in writing about it because my own awareness of it and sort of understanding about it and questioning myself about what I needed to do um, as the crisis continued um, was something that was on my mind. But I had noticed that most novels that tackled climate change um, fell into the category of post-apocalyptic post novels. Um, and so they would be in this sort of uh, scorched earth landscape um, and it would have certain tropes. And I felt like, although some of that work felt really you know, useful in terms of imagining the consequences of our actions, it also felt to me like, um, in a way, it made it feel so far off because the, the results were so extreme. And I was interested in what would it be like to write a sort of pre-apocalyptic novel where you already have the intimations of it but it hasn't come to fruition yet for most people. It's interesting because um, we may get to this more later, but just the idea that it's making us look at where we are now. now um, and that does feel, I think it gives us immediacy in a very different way from, you know, something like Emily St. John Mandela or one of those, as you say, one of those, those post novels. Um, can we look at, uh, first off, though, a, a bit about the relationships in the novel? And as you described um, in that, or you read in that first passage, we can see that Lizzie already is situated in a community and that she has all these dependent relationships and she's the sort of central fugal force in a lot of ways. Um, but dependencies are probably not that good in an emergency. <laughs> so can you just talk us through a little bit about where... Um, how Lizzie re relates to the people around her and where she's kind of positioned in relation to other people. Well, I think I think most of us know someone um, like Lizzie. Um, I certainly have elements of this in my own personality. Um, Lizzie's involved with all sorts of people, um, some of whom don't even know that she's involved with them. There's there's a line in a, a Gary Lutz short story that I always think about where someone asks the character, are you involved with anybody? And he says, everybody, I'm involved with everybody. <laughs> And Lizzie's like that. Lizzie, she's noticing the person um, on her corner in the trash bag poncho that she passes every day, wondering about this person's life. She notices the, uh, yeah, she calls him the doomed adjunct who comes in and has been working on his dissertation for so many years. Um, she has a sort of sense of, I, I think, uh, almost pathological level of, well, if, if, if empathy can be pathological, it's like, it's, her only way of relating to people is to sort of insert herself into their lives and worry about how to take care of them or how to help them. Um, and this leaves a very little splinter of self for her to have that's just her own. One of the things that's striking about the way the style of the novel is that it's quite fragmentary and so you don't have a kind of linear path through each relationship and some of it is just so deftly kind of hinted at. So the character of the mother, um, there's obviously this huge hinterland of the relationship with her, but we only just kind of glimpse that as we, we go through it. It's one of the pleasures, I think, of reading it that these stories are kind of revealed and unraveled um, as we go through. But could you talk a little bit about Henry, about the brother, because that's really a kind of key key relationship for Lizzie? Um, well, Lizzie has a younger brother who's um, who she sort of acts as a, a 
as a parental figure for in many ways. Um, he's always been um, a bit of someone who is always like falling apart in some part of his life. Um, and he's also a recovering addict. But more, more importantly, I think in terms of how Lizzie deals with him, he has a kind of um, OCD that causes him to have intrusive thoughts. So he's constantly having these kind of obsessive loops and worries. And one of the things that Lizzie has spent her life doing is kind of talking him through those. Um, and she comes from a family of a single mom, the father's not in the picture. So she's always kind of come in and um, tried to lighten her mother's load. The other kind of important thing about their background is that um, her mother's very religious and they were they were raised in a way that they both thought that there was a heaven and a hell. There was potentially a rapture that would one day lift up the good and leave behind the rest. Um, and so although Lizzie is no longer at all religious, she has a certain sense of morality that comes from that sense of um, that you might treat your stranger, any stranger you come across um, with the idea, the old saying there, but for the grace of God go I. So that's one of the reasons that she is so enmeshed in the others that she seems because they all seem to her like she could easily be in their place or they could easily be in hers. I'm sort of laughing because in my family, the, of the kind of second generation of not, not Catholic anymore, we call that the Catholic whiff, <laughs> but there's still, <laughs> still enough <Yeah>. guilt. <laughs> yeah. She's just got a little bit of the, the yeah. It's like my friends who, are, who grew up Jewish and they say they're Jew-ish. <laughs> right. <laughs> So there's these the immediate relationships and then there's the wider community. So she works in a library, which is obviously, you know, a very communal space. And we learn a lot about the building that she lives in and the um, meditation class that she helps to put the seats out for, but she doesn't quite know how to fit herself into that. So she's connected in all these different ways. Um, and I suppose it lends the question of, you know, how how much impact and how much responsibility, particularly in relation to, in relation to the brother, to Henry, um, how much impact can we really have on someone else's life? And how much is that our responsibility? Because um, we learn in the story that she's... Um, uh, that there's various times in her life where she's put her own needs kind of subservient to her brothers and there's an element of that with other members of the family. So it, it raises that question. Why was that of, of interest to you? Why was that a question to pursue? Um, well, I had noticed something that sometimes some of my uh, students said, my college students, that they would say that they, uh, that they had a friend who needed help, but that they needed to take care of themselves and they didn't have the bandwidth to deal with it. And I, I remember thinking, oh, that's so different than sort of the way that I am, um, because I don't think I have that concept that you're allowed to not, um, you're, you're not, that you can just say, oh, that's not for me. I need to protect myself. And so in, in terms of her brother and in terms of the, the part where she um, is constantly sort of um, trying to clean up his messes and trying to uh, take care of him. Um, I think she just feels that that's part of love. Um, and now a therapist would argue differently, perhaps, that that is a kind of enablement. Um, but I think she also feels like um, in some ways it's easier to look after other people than to look after herself. And so the questions that the book begins to encompass um, about the larger world and the larger community of caretaking, at first, Lizzie's quite resistant to them. I mean, she thinks, what, do I have to worry about the whole world now? Because um, she's already taking care of the patrons who come in and her family and her brother and her mother. And she feels sort of like, now I'm supposed to worry about people I don't even know that aren't even in my orbit. Um, and I think that question to me is very crucial. Like, what do we owe people that we don't know? Um, and what do we know? What do we owe in a civic society? And what do we owe um, to future generations? And all of those questions are things that um, were kind of swirling around in my head as I began this novel. There's a point in the novel where she's almost not forced, but there's a question about whether her responsibilities lie to her brother or to her immediate family, to her husband and son. And it's something that you've dealt with in your previous fiction, but is that almost, is that the lot of women that the question is to who else um, you owe your responsibilities and where does the self sit in relation to that? Yeah, there's a, there's a line in a, um, a Helen Simpson short story I remember, and it's the, the mother talks about 
herself like breaking herself like a biscuit into all these different pieces until there's like none left and people keep saying well now I need a little bit of biscuit here and I feel that that's what's going on with Lizzie that there's always someone that needs more from her and um the parts in the novel where she is she's actually trying to come up with I think a a more um a, a more useful philosophy than just that you you do whatever someone needs of you she's trying to think of in in terms of like what does it mean to have um, a moral understanding of the world or a, a sense of responsibility to those around you um, that comes not just from guilt, mm. but also from, um, from care and, and from engagement? I think that bigger question relates so well um, to the title, weather. Um, and on one level, we can't control the weather. But then with climate change, that's almost exactly <laughs> what we're doing. And, and that will be one of the ways that finally we are forced to reckon with, with climate change. And I love the title because it operates on so many different levels because there's the emotional weather and the political weather and, um, and even physical weather. You know, when we first meet um, Ben, uh, sorry, Henry, he's soaked. <laughs> um, and there's uh, lots of sweating and things in the novel. Like it's quite a visceral sort of thing. Um, but that question of, you know, whether being outside of our control, but also within it, in a way, um, is one of the big questions in the book. And I think you've, you spoke about it a little bit, about how, you can, how far you can intervene in a person's life. But how do we begin to understand where our personal responsibility is in relation to ch climate change? And how did you set out to ask that question in this novel? Well, part of the thinking about this novel came from um, like a series of conversations I had over almost a decade with one of my best friends who's um, a novelist, Lydia Millet, who also um, works for an environmental organization. And she is one of those people who's really on the ground doing work all the time. And I would listen to all the stories she told me, um, the sort of doom and gloom uh, details about what was happening. And I just realized that I, I took it all in, I believed it. There wasn't denial about it, but it didn't, I didn't feel it. I, I, I didn't feel any emotional connection to it. And I was curious why I didn't. Um, and so in a way, writing the novel was partly about writing myself into feeling, feeling something um, about it and feeling actually um, what it meant to um, I'd noticed also, again, with my students, I'd noticed just over a few years ago that there was this new um, kind of offhand fatalism that they had about climate change, that it was just a given. They would talk about not having children. They would talk about how they would live in these um, apocalyptic landscapes. And it wasn't even something that they um, would make. I, I teach writing. It wasn't even something they would make as the main part of their stories. It was that much of a of a sort of, of a, of a given. And I started to wonder um, about what did it mean to try to grapple with this? The philosopher, Timothy Morton, um, he says climate change is a hyper object. It's too big for us to get our minds around. So one of the first things I wanted to do was like how to bring it down to a human scale and, and even to a domestic scale, a non-heroic scale because I feel like one of the main problems that we have as humans is that we're, our hubris is so big that we think that we can control. I mean, if you look at geoengineering plans right now, we're still trying to control the weather. We're still trying to figure out. And I think that I wanted to write about something that was humbler and quieter and that included a character who had some intellectual humility about what she knew and what she didn't know. Again, it's, it's like some of these other kind of strands in the novel that it just builds quietly in the background. There's this sort of rising sea level almost of, it feels very oppressive. Um, but through that, through that time, Lizzie meets different people who are dealing with the prospect of climate change in different ways. And so she's this, she's the assistant to somebody who's dealing with it very head on. And through that, uh, that character, she meets other people who are financiers or backers who have different, more or less radical thoughts on how to, um, how much kind of background reading and things did you do of all of these different approaches to climate change? Oh, I just, I, I read reams and reams of things. I mean, I, I have a, the world's least efficient way of writing a novel. <laughs> the 
I, I read entire books to get like one line that I want to write about, you know, billionaires in, in uh, Silicon Valley seasteading or, um, or something. There's a, there's an epigraph to my to my book that is from something that was said by the um, Puritans, and I read a whole long history of the Puritans that was very dry and very boring just to get this one little bit. Um, so my main question when I was when I was doing all the research was just um, how much should it be about facts and how much should it be about figures? Because for those of you that have um, read a lot of things about climate change, there's often a part where you just sort of hit a wall of statistics, a wall of numbers. And, and I'm very um, sympathetic to why that happens in most books because there's been such a strong campaign to not have people understand the science of it um, from sort of bad actor parties that I think that uh, it's hard not to feel like you have to prove your point at each thing. But I felt like with a novel, I wanted to do what a novel can do best, which is to show what it feels like to be alive right now, to show what it feels like to be inside this person's um, head, and to show what it's like to live in these different like registers. On the one hand, imagining something that is um, apocalyptic and grand and sweeping, and on the other hand, um, trying to make sure you get your kid to school on time. And what does it mean to toggle between those two things? Um, and that's what I was trying to show in Weather, kind of how Lizzie does that. Um, without, and eventually she's more able to keep both of those things um, in her head at the same time. It's so interesting, and we'll come to this a wee bit more in a minute, but how relevant that question has become over the last, <laughs> over the last five or six months. Um, but just what you said before about the kind of fatalism of your students, which is sort of alarming and entirely understandable. And then your own kind of personal feeling of, of, of how do you approach this when it seems that individual action in the face of kind of enormous industrial non-action seems sometimes to be so futile. Um, and it's really interesting what you're saying and what weather reveals about breaking it down into the, the human. And, the, um, and one of the things I love about the novel is that it gradually forces you to look it in the eye in a way. Um, but it's interesting, some of the other characters in the novel, so Sylvia, she goes off and decides to just live in the desert. And there's another character who is kind of drawn back to war zones over and over again. But Lizzie's sort of challenge or her resolution with it in the end is, is more, not to give away any spoilers, but it's a more, it's a quieter, understated kind of um, resolve that, that she, that she achieves with it. Why was that the particular route for you for this character? Well, I think that it's very easy when you first um, begin thinking a lot about the climate uh, situation and you sort of realize the extent um, of it and also the question about how it's just happening so much faster than was originally expected. Um, I think most people's reaction, and it's a very understandable one, is to kind of figure out, try to figure out, well, what about my family? What about my people? I mean, we even see it on a, on a, in a much more sinister way at a nationwide scale of people being like my people, not these people and all the sort of othering and um, talk of borders and um, fear mongering against uh, people who are refugees. All of that sort of thing, I think is an extrapolation from this original kind of idea of like, I will take care of my own. But the truth is that like humans have not Sur survived as long as we have as a species because we have gone it alone. Um, we are uh, we are an adaptive um, species and we work best when we work in community. And so one of the things that I think this character begins to understand is that all of the sort of um, fantasy she has about if she could somehow run away with her family or keep them mm -hmm. safe run away with the war journalist or do whatever, that actually none of that keeps you safe. It, it's, it's, a false, um, it's a false kind of security. And as long as we all sort of live in these separate silos of dread, we keep ourselves from being able to um, figure out how to rebuild and make a society that is more resilient to the terrors coming down the pike. So I know that like the, the founder of um, the environmental organization 350.org, he's, he's often asked, what can I do as an individual? And you know, his, his, what he always says is, don't act as an individual. 
what you can do is not act as an individual. You can find a community and you can build roots and you can figure out how to work as part of a community. And so that's one of the things that happens to Lizzie. And in the book, I have it, it, it comes through, she knows a little bit of search and rescue lore. Um, and one of the things that she learned is that, um, which is a true fact, which I just loved, which was that um, a lot of people when they're lost, they're so convinced that they're lost that even when a search party finds them, they walk right past them. <laughs> they, don't, they don't believe they're found. Um, and so they train search and rescue people that they often have to tackle the person who's lost and, and stop them from it. The, and I thought that was a really interesting image of how often we feel like there aren't other people that can help us in, um, in fighting against these dangerous moments. I mean, there have been these sort of wonderful things that have happened in the last few months, as well as all the terrible things, which is the coming together of the protests movement, um, what we're seeing right now in Belarus, where it's like people are not walking past yeah. their rescue, people are joining hands with them. And I think that's what tentatively Lizzie is realizing when she thinks of that towards the end. How much did the political climate in America over the last couple of years, and I just think of that phrase, you just used the separate silos of dread, which is really terrifying and perfect. Um, but how much has the, the political climate over the last couple of years in Trump's America informed, informed this book? Well, I wrote uh, at least half of it before he was elected. Um, I, like many people, didn't think he was gonna be elected. Um, and and then I was quite um, I was quite stymied as a writer trying to figure out if I wanted to put that in my book. In general, I don't like to write things that might date mm. in a novel, and and so I was very I was very concerned. Also, things happened at such a clip from the minute he was elected. Uh, there's just been this systematic um, dismantling mm. of things we take for granted and institutions and. Um, a subsequent kind of strange normalization, oh, that was never that way, that it was very hard to write about. And I struggled for a good year and a half trying to figure it out. And then I finally decided that if I, if I, if I left it out, um, because it did bring a whole different kind of dangers in. And, and I did think that all the things I've been reading about climate change, it felt like I was watching the sort of shadow of that um, that kind of fear, that kind of dread um, come to life in this kind of nationalist rhetoric. And um, so I wanted to put it in, but I also decided that I would make it, he's not named in the book. You can tell who he is if you know him, but I wanted it to be that if you read this book and you didn't know who he was, you would know what kind of person right. was elected in the States. And the things that I guess have changed over the last few months is that there's a couple sections in there um, where uh, Lizzie begins to sort of worry about fascism, encroaching fascism, and she's still considered, it's still considered very alarmist to say those things. Um, and one of the main things that I think has changed is that those parts of the books don't read as, as, a, as quite as alarmist anymore. It's amazing to me the things that you were writing about and kind of an analyzing and trying to shine a light on. And then just at the point where the novel comes out, coronavirus happens. I mean, <laughs> I heard on a podcast that you gave, you were saying that the this wasn't the disaster that I was prepping for, <laughs> which puts yeah, it yeah, kind of I, nicely. Yeah, I did not have pandemic on my apocalypse bingo card. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, um, I mean, the only thing, it, it has a few odd things in common with the climate crisis. Um, one, I think, is that uh, we were told about it um, by scientists, mm. and it is something where the math really matters. <laughs> In those early days of the pandemic, um, trying to get you know millions of people to understand exponential math was something that science communicators were really, I think, struggling with. Um, and the same thing with climate change, the numbers don't sound as serious as they are. If you say, oh, we're gonna have a 1C rise, you know, that intuitively that doesn't sound like anything to people. Um, so I think it was similar in that way, but also um, the, the interesting part is just how both of these particular um, disasters, they almost bring into this kind of um, 
fluorescent, you know, light, the interconnectedness that we talk about more abstractly. So um, there's no getting away from climate. And as it turns out, there's really, you know, New Zealand accepted. Um, there's really no get, getting away from the pandemic either. And so this idea of interconnectedness, which can seem kind of like a squishy term or kind of new agey kind of term has turned out to be very, um, very important and something that we all have to think about all the time. And the one thing I think that I've noticed is like, I think it's impossible now to go to the grocery store and not think about the person that stocked the shelf or the person who's ringing up your things or the person that grew the food. I hope you're thinking about all of that. We all should be thinking about that all the time anyway, but this has made it manifest. Yeah. It's, yeah, there's such a kind of, I've become a bit obsessed with the idea of community and other people and how you relate in the world and who's dependent on you and all of those kind of questions. But you had done so much research on kind of disaster thinking and prepping and things. Um, for you personally, how did all of that come into play as you've navigated um, the world over the last four to five months? Um, well, a lot of it didn't cross over, but the one thing that I would say from, especially from reading disaster psychology that was uh, really relevant was I just read again and again um, that it is so difficult for, for people to um, believe that something really terrible is happening. Um, you know, they call it the normalcy bias. And it just basically means that we can't really understand events that we don't already have a template um, that's similar to. So, um, so that's why people, um, you know, a, a person in a burning building will often like straighten their desk and, you know, take time to brush their hair or do, I mean, people do all these sort of things because your brain is saying, I don't recognize this. And that's why if you're on a plane, they always say to you, don't take anything. It's because people will, will mill as they call it, They'll, they will stay and do all these things because their brain is looking for the similar thing that's happened. And so they'll actually just stand in a burning plane instead of getting off it. And so the one thing that, that I think reading about this stuff did was it, it allows me to think more quickly that, okay, this is not a normal time. And so, um, I don't live in New York anymore. I live about an hour and a half away. And at the very beginning of the pandemic, <laughs> as the designated doomer friend, um, I was receiving a lot of calls about pe from, from friends who some people had no choice about leaving New York, but some did. And they would often call me and ask me if they should, should I, should I go? I have a place to go. Should I go? And I would say, yes, go if you, if you can. No, don't go out to the store. No, don't go get one, one more thing. It is an emergency. Um, but the difference between the pandemic and the climate change is it's such a fast moving emergency that, you know, there was only like a week lag between people right. being like, I don't know, maybe it's nothing and complete catastrophe. Yeah, there is almost something reassuring, I think, though, about your brain doing what it sort of should do, even if it leads to strange results. You know, I remember talking um, or lots of times actually throughout the last few months, talking to other readers and writers about about how difficult it's been to concentrate and a lot of people who find it really hard to read lately um, and I'd include myself in that and then and then understanding from a really kind of clever calm blog post from somebody who was used to working in conflict zones that your brain suppresses some functions that it doesn't require just at that moment and so it's not that surprising because you're actually focusing on a whole load of other more immediate kind of stress response <laughs> activity which is sort of alarming to know that that's what your brain's doing but sort of reassuring at the same <laughs> at the same time well I think this is a confusing um catastrophe because um it, it there's a weird mix of terror and tedium right and um, some of us are you know at home and we're in our home environments and therefore it doesn't feel very scary when you're home, but going out or going to your job, I'm about to start teaching in person for the first time. And it's very clear to me that that's a very different feeling when I imagine what those days are gonna be like, um, because it's not, it, it, you know, the protective shell of home is no longer around you. Um, but yes, I mean, I think that one of the hardest things about this is, um, people are experiencing trauma, mm. but 
on the one hand, they don't always recognize it as trauma. Like I have the same thing. I can't read, I can't write, but I'm like, what's wrong with me? Right. <laughs> um, but, but on the other hand, also there's this sense that if you're aware of how much um, worse it could be, then even no matter what's happening to people, anything short of, of your being dead or a family member being dead, you're not even allowed to sort of say, this is hard. And I think that's really also a sort of psychologically wrong thing. Like people can't even acknowledge what's going on with them without being sort of attacked as like not being cognizant of, of how um, other people who are more on the front lines are feeling. And I, I think that's just not very human. You know, normally if you, whatever it is, lose your job, cancel your wedding, um, cancel everything you've done or all those kind of things, you're allowed to grieve a little bit. Right. And I think we're all very um, trying not to grieve and also trying to stay in this limbo because we don't know how long it's going to last. Right. This feels like a good time to talk about the obligatory note of hope. <laughs> Can you tell us about, well, actually just about humour in the novel in general and then about the, the obligatory note of hope. Um, well, Lizzie, the librarian, she ends up, in the novel working for um, a former professor of hers who's become a podcaster and um, has podcasts about climate and all sorts of other uh, sort of scary things coming down the pike. And at one point um, she's talking to her and Sylvia, the podcaster says, oh, I can't talk to you right now because I'm writing an article and I have to put on, I have to tack on an obligatory note of hope. And if you've ever you know, read environmental uh, articles, you you know what I'm talking about because often it's in, they're incredibly dark, they're incredibly doom laden, and then at the very end there's this sort of uh, wishful thinking about well if everyone in the whole world would cut their carbon emissions in such and such way and we'd all do it immediately, then we'd be fine. And so when I was thinking about the end of the novel, I knew that I wanted it to have um, I wanted it to be I guess hopefulness wasn't really what I was going for. I wanted it to feel honest. And at the end of it, um, she's tentatively um, thinking more about what she can do and about community, but she also doesn't know what's gonna happen. Mm. But I knew that I had also come across in all my research, things that did make me feel hopeful, um, whether it was people doing local initiatives about climate change or people in different, very tumultuous times of history who had, um, stood up for um, other people and done things. So I made a separate website called Obligatory Note of Hope that, that you can go to at the end of the book if you wish to. And I wanted to make it um, something that you jump off to because I didn't think everybody would wanna go there. Mm. Not everybody wants an obligatory note of hope. Um, I mean, I remember when I worked at a bookstore uh, one time I was always recommending books to this one guy and one time he came in, came in and he said, could you just recommend one book that's not so goddamn depressing. I want to kill myself. And I realized, oh, I, I think I, I think I don't have that category like of depressing. I think I just think like, oh, good. Um, and so I wanted those people that are fine with not having that. But I also wanted a portal for um, if you do feel like you want to get involved, if you do feel like I'm tired of thinking about this as an individual, I put some organizations that I feel like are doing good work um, and I also put a section called Tips for Trying Times, which has um, quotes from people that survived like the siege of Sarajevo, people that um, have lived through other really difficult times in history and, and what were some of the small human things that got them through. Hmm. I think for lots of us, it's art and music and reading and things that does kind of get us through. Um, is there anything in particular that has sustained you or that you've turned to from the world of the arts over the last few months? Um, well, I feel like uh, I found myself turning back to some things that I read when I was younger or at different points in my, my life, like sort of, I think of them as like sort of fundamental texts. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm rereading Rilke. Um, I, um, I'm also finding that, uh, I reread a, I reread a bunch of um, of Camus, which was really interesting. I, I read the plague actually long before this, 
while I was writing this book because I was thinking about how do you write about something. Um, but but what I came across in in that book is this really interesting idea um, that I found really helpful where the doctor in the book, um, he's asked sort of why does he go on when all the odds are so against him? And, and he says that he believes in something um, called active fatalism. And active fatalism is basically that you you don't know if what you're going to do is going to work. Um, and you're not even, you're, you're sort of skeptical that it will, but you still go forward stumbling in the dark, trying to do good. And, um, and that's what I've, that's what I felt like, um, both with the climate crisis, um, and with the pandemic, um, that we really just have to, to stumble in the dark and try to do good. And that, um, saying that it's too late, saying that it's hopeless, all of that to me is another form of denial. It's just a softer form um, and, and one that lets us off the hook. And um, I, I don't wanna be let off the hook. I, I, I wanna try to, um, I wanna try to engage with this very difficult but very interesting moment in time, which has a lot of exhilarating elements to it as well. Um, people I think for the first time are starting to imagine what they might do together versus as alone. And um, that to me is a very hopeful sign. I think this <laughs> <laughs> I think this book is a huge contribution to that project. Thank you so much. Through the wonders of technology, we have some questions um, from the audience. Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting one from Emma. In what ways do you think fiction can engage with crises like climate change or COVID-19? Um, and do you see that as activism in itself? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't, I, I think it is in a way. I mean, I had a joke when I was writing this novel that I would like go out of my little study that I'm sitting in right now. And I would, I would say to my husband, well, I'm so glad I, I solved climate change by writing my weird experimental novel, you know, because it felt very absurd um, as an as an act. But um, but I do think that I really think that the arts and the humanities that they have a part to play in um, in sort of allowing us to feel or dream our way into situations that we're not in yet um, to sort of think through possibilities to imagine what kind of world it is we wanna be in. Um, and also just to, to keep us from shutting down. Right now, I think the world, it's, it's so traumatic right now to be in the world that the temptation is to shut down completely, to just um, numb yourself out with hours and hours of Netflix, which believe me, I've done plenty of. Um, but I think that a good, a good novel, a good film, um, good music, it has more of a quality of opening, opening up, opening you up and allowing you to feel actually a sense of freedom. In my tips for trying times, one of the things that um, I thought was, was very beautiful was people who lived through the um, siege of Ren Leningrad were talking about how they read Tolstoy. Everybody was reading Tolstoy. And they said that they, they did it because it helped them know how to feel. It'll help them know how to have a proper attitude towards the vicissitudes of what they were going through. Um, in the same way, people playing music on the streets of, of Sarajevo during wartime. This was a way for people to, um, in the midst of like just the darkest possible situation, um, have a moment of touching something sublime or, or feeling something sublime. And so I think the best, best arts do that for you. Do you have a sense of when people will, I mean, it's, I th I'm sure there are artists and writers working right now who are responding to the moment in front of them right this second. Um, what are your thoughts on that as a writer? When do you think if, you know, will you deal very directly with the experiences of now or what are your thoughts? Have you begun to work on anything that's related to the crisis we're in right now? You know, I haven't and it, I, I've been asked to write I don't know, about 30 pandemic journals. Um, it does seem like, uh, you know, everybody is is diving right in. Um, I am a really slow writer. And so, you know, someone said to me the other day, it's like, whatever is the opposite of a hot take is what you do. So <laughs> I don't think, I mean, I'm just like the world's coldest take. So if I write about the pandemic, it will probably be many years from now. Um, but I, 
I don't, I, I mean, I've felt, um, I felt it was very difficult to, to write in this moment, um, mostly just trying to survive it yeah. and help the people around me survive it. But, um, but I do think that there, I think there's gonna be a lot of, of fiction coming out about it. I mean, I, I would I'd expect the first to come next year. <laughs> um, it, it reminds me a little bit of 9-11. You know, there were a lot of things that came out quite quickly after 9-11 and most of them weren't very good um, because I think that there's also the strange problem of every writer in the world is actually experiencing this. So what are you gonna say right. that's different? Um, so yeah, for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about it in a, in a, the thing I think will be interesting is, is I imagine some writers are gonna come up with a kind of magic realist version of it. Yeah. Um, like, you know, UNESCO did with rhinoceros and, and will it be like, oh, I'm writing about Nazism, but I'm actually writing about my friends turning into rhinoceroses. So I think that will be kind of fun to see, but the, the, the ones that are more um, torn from life. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to do it. Somebody does, but I don't. Ali Smith. <laughs> but Ali Smith, yes, to the rescue. She will, she'll figure it out. <laughs> in a way, as a reader, I think I'm more interested in the stuff that comes further down the pipeline as we begin to kind of process things, um, hopefully from the point of view of distance, and you begin to, and writers can help you to kind of understand and reveal things that you've all shared. But as you say at the moment, because we're all kind of equally experiencing it at the moment, what is the, the hot take? You know, I would much rather the, the lukewarm, colder, <laughs> colder one, I think. Um, Here's another line of attack altogether. If climate change will affect future generations most of all, how do you predict Eli will cope as the son in the novel? Have his parents given him enough? Mm. I mean, I think that's probably a question that everyone's asking um, who are parents, like, have you done enough? Have you? Um, I, my personal answer is that I think as a parent, the best thing you can do for your children is, is, you know, not buy the doomstead in, in Greenland, although go for it if you can afford that. But, um, but I think to get out of your own comfort zone and do the activism um, that is required right now to try to see if we can, um, because basically, you know, there's no stopping climate change, but there is mitigating it, there is adapting to it. And so I feel like those old posters they had, what did you do during the war, daddy? Um, you know, I don't, part of writing this novel was that I didn't want to answer that question like, oh, you know, I, I didn't do anything because I find environmentalism kind of boring, which I do. <laughs> um, so I, I sort of felt like I didn't want to say to my daughter that I hadn't, that, I, that once I knew about it, once I knew the extent of it, and I didn't want to say it to my students either, that I just was like, oh, well, good good for you. And at the very least, um, I think what you can do is you can, you can just take a look about whether you have either time or money. And, um, and there's so many youth-led groups right now that are um, really thoughtful and doing really useful work and to, to, give, to give time or money to them if you have it. It's tricky, isn't it? Because as a parent, I'm sort of, my children, who are very tiny, but what they are beginning to learn already about, you know, what we're doing to the world, they're horrified. They're just horrified. And you want to not frighten them, but you need them also to retain that sense of urgency about it. But about how do you live with that? And I suppose that's one of the things that weather explores so beautifully. How do you, how do you cope with that rising sea level? <laughs> okay. yeah, that's one of the questions, right, that, that she's, that's asked on the podcast. How do you, uh, how do you prepare your children for the coming mm. chaos? And, you know, she says, you know, you can, you can teach them to farm, you can teach them to sow, but techniques for calming a fearful mind might be best. Um, another one in, from uh, the audience is from Juliana, and she is asking about your writing process. What's your writing process like? Um, well, I find it, I find my writing process sort of torturous, but <laughs> it's just very slow. Um, I write in little increments. Um, I tend to write um, sort of at the paragraph level and then build from there. Um, sometimes I 
do that for a really long time and I still feel stuck. And then I print everything out and I cut it up and I paste it onto boards and I try to look at it to see if there's some connections that I'm missing. Um, I don't write in long drafts um, because I sort of lose the delicacy of, of the connections I wanna make when I do that. Um, but what I do have sort of very, very long sections of is the research that goes into the book, whether it's, if I'm gonna write about transhumanism on one page, you know, I might read a book about it and I'll, I'll type that out. Um, so I have lots and lots of pages of that. And then I start trying to, I mean, I feel like uh, I, have, I have these uh, boards that I make. I feel like I should pull one out for a little Zoom. Please do. <laughs> Let's see if I can get it. This is the real benefit of Zoom. This is the benefit of Zoom. We'll see if I can find it. Though. Being into other people's homes. Well, here's one. You can tell I didn't plan this. Because <laughs> So sometimes I do oh, wow. crazy things like this, where I um, I put up like something that is like like this one is probably different. Um, this is this is all stuff about um, mysticism um, because there's a couple strains of that in the book. So I put different things on there, and I I put them all on without thinking of the order so that when I can walk by, I can see different things. And I got this idea from visual artists I know who often have a, a chance element, um, a sort of trance operations thing. And, you know, when I was joking earlier that I'm so inefficient, I mean, I probably get like seven new things from doing it, but it's kind of fun. And it's a way to get back into the book when I'm feeling distant from it. Amazing. In the interview um, from just a couple of days ago with Hilary Mantel for the book festival, she was talking about how she gets distracted occasionally and she kind of writes a bit of whatever short story or idea is bubbling away and then shoves it in the drawer so that she can concentrate on what she's doing. And then she'll go back and parse through all of those kind of potential threads. Is that something that you relate to? I, I don't go back and forth when I'm writing. I don't write other things, but... Um, in fact, I sort of tunnel every single thing that happens to me into, <laughs> into the novel. Um, I feel like I have sort of like a depression era kind of writing style where I just save every piece of string and every paper clip, you know, is going to go into the novel. Um, and then somehow the novels are so short. I feel like I feel like I'm always imagining they're going to be so big when I'm writing them, and then they never are. Do you but, edit very heavily? Because you do, you know, that fragmentary style. Like, I wonder, do you lo lose a lot of material right in that way? Well, I um, I'd say I lose it in the part where I'm writing it. Like I don't write it and then edit it down. It's it's hard for me to get very much on the page. I often like to write a paragraph, I often will get rid of a lot of things over and over and over again before I decide on what. It, so the, the revision process, you know, I think most writers um, do it closer to the end of a draft and I'm kind of doing it um, at, at each stage of it. So that the good part is then there's not that much revision at the end. And a final question, and you may be pleased that you've only got just a minute to answer it, but which writers do you most admire and who would you recommend for us next? Oh, okay. Um, well, I've, um, I've just been reading um, Natalia Ginsburg, um, who I think is a great writer. Um, I, uh, some contemporary writers I really admire are um, uh, Rachel Cusk, um, Samantha Schweblin, who's an Argentinian writer. Um, I um, I feel like one of the things that's really exciting right now is to just try to um, discover as many people writing in as many different parts of the world as I can. Um, so I'm always like reading those lists of best translated books and and getting those and and reading those and um, yeah, there's a lot of good a lot of good stuff happening right now. There is, and it's through the miracle of the thing that is Edinburgh International Book Festival that we've been able to do that with you today, Jenny Offal. Thank you so much for your time and for this beautiful book. Um, and oh. hopefully we'll welcome you to Edinburgh in person one day in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.